Bob Arpa doesn't need an introduction, but everybody knows uh, who he is, <clears throat> and uh, he has been highly influential for to the summer school. As was said this morning, he has been part of the summer school since uh, it started, and uh, that's all I can say. So, Bob, uh, you have everything, right? You are the boss, so you are the host, and uh, yeah, you can start. Okay, thanks, Anna. Good to see you. Good to be back. As I mentioned in my brief introduction this morning, it's my 18th time, apparently, starting in 2002. So uh, I don't know, the years roll by, uh, <laughs> but it's always good, always good, well, usually to come to Eugene this time, we'll fake it. Uh, we, we miss out on all the informal opportunities, but maybe we can replace those with breakout rooms or Slack discussions or whatever the latest thing you're supposed to do is. So I'll try to be available as much as I can during the during our during our lectures. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to give a introductory lectures. Uh, every year we try to get some introductory lectures because there's a very broad range of backgrounds from the people and we want that to be a broad range of background from people who are attending. And uh, so some of you know everything and are yawning and you can tune out if you want. I mean, if you already know everything, uh, if not, uh, what I'm trying to do is then give you some basics that you need to know to like be au fait with the terminology and the methods that people use for the most part in the course of uh, lectures here at summer school and elsewhere when you go to meetings at Popple or something like that. So you, you can uh, do that. So that's my, my idea. And I'm using as a framework, my textbook, Practical Foundation for Programming Languages, PFPL, published by Cambridge University Press. And if you look there, I gave a link to the webpage and the, there's a rata because I did make mistakes. Uh, there's a commentary, which is, uh, a different sort of errata in a sense that's uh, trying to give you some idea of what was in my mind when I organized things the way I did. And then there's a whole bunch of supplements because over years I teach from the book at CMU and I update things and modify things. And, and so that's what I do. So, so you should look at the supplements in particular. However, I'm not promising to follow everything to the letter, but I am gonna refer you to PFPL because there just is no way I can teach you like what I teach in a semester at CMU in a matter of four lectures. So we have to find some compromise. So interrupt me, ask questions. Uh, the chat, I heard someone monitor the chat and don't be insulted if I say I'm not gonna answer that right now, just like, I'm going to do my best to balance all the considerations and, and we'll try to do that. Okay, so that's like the ground rules of how I usually operate. So here's what I'm doing is I'm going to do a crash course in PL theory. And I like to think of it as organized in this way that I uh, have a bunch of uh, talking about the syntax. So what I want to do on the fly is I have a logical framework for the textbook. I have a way of organizing the way you present abstract syntax and how you treat it and a way of organizing how you present systems of rules, for example, formalism for typing in such a way that you don't have to think about anything. However, I can't really teach you the whole idea of a logical framework. That would be another, another bunch of lectures. So I'm kind of going to on the fly make use of some ideas from there to give you a flavor of like what it is you're supposed to be doing when you write down certain rules, for example, and what sorts of things you're not allowed to do because I see all the time in papers, people write down stuff that to be honest, I mean, to be frank about it, is nonsense. So in particular, you don't get to write any old English you want. That's like, no, that's not what is going on. So I'll try to explain a little bit of that. So we explain the syntax, which is in terms of binding structure. So we have notions of binding and scope. Then what I call the statics, which is, well, what you think it is. So it's an inductively defined formalism typically for typing, but I'll also use equations a little bit this time for reasons that have to do with where I'm going, which comes up in the next slide. Then I talk about how to execute things using principally uh, Plotkin's method of structural operational semantics. So that's, that's like a favorite thing that I use. So this is called structural operational, if I abbreviate it there, semantics or SOS, yes. You'll be saying SOS possibly, but I'll get used to it. This is the best method period for writing down the dynamics of a programming language. There is nothing better in my opinion, or if there is, I don't know about it. Uh, and I kind of think I would. So what we'll do is be using SOS. So SOS works by defining a transition system on states and what kind of states will vary as we go through my lectures. Eventually, what one of the things I'm doing is states are going to turn out to be processes. I want to connect up everything with process algebra in a certain way. So I'm gonna do that as I go along. Then I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there's generally an idea 
that if you're writing down a language, you just specify the syntax and the statics and the dynamics, that you want to do it in a way that makes sense. And so the minimum criterion for making sense is called safety, which is uh, saying that they cohere, the statics and the dynamics can cohere. If you like, the static can be interpreted as a prediction about what will happen with the dynamics. And the minimum criterion is that they are coherent in a certain sense, which I will explain. And believe it or not, almost every language out there fails this most rudimentary criterion. Haskell does not satisfy this criterion. You know, Scala does not satisfy this criterion. And as far as I know, they can't be fixed. They're just like, without like undoing a tremendous amount of things. But from my point of view, if you're writing on a status and dynamics and it doesn't even fit together, I, I honestly, I don't know what you're doing. Because in particular, you're not gonna be able to prove any theorems or any theorems you prove are meaningless. So this is just like, the basic criterion for what it means to know what you're doing. So that's the way I think about that. And then I think I won't have time to devote, be able to devote any lecture time to this, but then besides the coherence criterion, we want to say a lot about program behavior and in particular notions of equality of, of programs, which are fall under the rubric of the general theory of logical relations. And I won't have time at, for the most part here. I'll mention it in today's lecture, but I will only mention but that's another topic entirely that you want to know about. If you want to know about type theory and programming languages, one of the most basic things you must know is the theory of logical relations. And I will tell you, it's a very active development because, uh, well, actually I'm actively developing it. And if you look, there's a, a, a paper on my webpage about very recent developments in this area, but I originally thought I might have a chance to lecture about those, but I think it's impossible for me to develop enough ideas to be me. To, for you to be able to follow me. So I, I, I abandoned that thought. Okay, the thing I wanna say about this is the methods I'm gonna describe are quite comprehensive. I'm gonna to try to, well, for lack of a better way of saying it, rush through, to some degree, I will feel rushed, a whole bunch of ideas so that I can expose you. And then I have the backing store there of all these supplements and the books so that you can go back and learn them. I can't say everything as we go along. Now, the thing I wanna say about this is that the ideas scale and are fully mechanizable. So in particular, Carl Curry and I, about a dozen or so years ago, and there's a link to it, might, might be even longer than that, 2009, if I remember, so it could be going on 13 years, let's say a dozen years. A dozen years ago, Carl Curry and I gave a complete mechanized proof of the type safety for standard ML using these methods, and it's all mechanized in 12. So if you like you know, mechanization, everyone does, uh, you can do video games with all of this stuff. This is the, this is the thing you need to know. But what I can tell you is, it's a mistake to think you can do mechanization without knowing what you're doing. It may seem self-evident, but matter of fact, uh, there is a tendency to like get carried away with what will happen for you automatically. And to I've had people say, well, here's the term, but I, I can't actually tell you the proof. That's like not a very good state of affairs. So if you really wanna know what you're doing, then I think you need to know these things in any case. So here's my plan for my lecture plan for the course. How far we get, as it says here in the bubble, depends on you, depends on how, how much you know and how much I can get away with. But the, the framework I'm gonna do, I, I, I guess I got carried away today with the, uh, the usual thing of T plus plus. So I'm gonna start out with something called good of T. I'm calling it T plus plus because I'm gonna throw in a bunch of other stuff. But the main thing is about total functional programming. I have a point to make there. And the point has to do with coming where I get to the end. So I have a, an overall plan and whether I get there, I don't know. Then I'll talk about Plotkin's PCF in an extended form, which is partial, partial functional programming. Then Reynolds is modernized algo, or he calls it idealized algo. I call it modernized algo for reasons I'll get to. He wouldn't, in a manner of speaking, wouldn't let me call it idealized algo, so I don't. So I call it MA, modernized algo, but it rhymes, so you're supposed to catch that it rhymes with Reynolds's. So, and then McQueen's uh, system of modules for, for, ML, for the ML family of languages. And one of the points I wanna make there is to talk about the dependent types in a programming language setting with what is called a phase distinction because that's an idea that I've been using quite a lot recently and it has legs. So it's like a lot of uh, things can be, can be handled in the setting that I find really exciting. Um, but I do wanna make a meta point, which was in 1986, standard ML was a dependently typed programming language. Programming language in the ordinary sense that you are used to like ML, Camel, uh, this family of languages and it was based on dependent types from square one. And so that's a point I want to mention. So the idea that this is some recent innovation is a little bit uh, fictional. So I want to explain that whole story, okay, if I can manage to get the time. 
Okay, so let's start on talking about T plus plus. Any question, you should jump in. Let me have a quick look over here on the chat, but I'll rely on Harrison to jump in and interrupt me if there's something like this. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you a bunch of things on the fly. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you about on the fly, as it were, is I want to explain about abstract binding trees. And the general idea is if you think of abstract syntax trees, there, besides variables, you have variable ones that you can substitute for. Besides variables, you have uh, things, well, trees, they could be called trees, but I, I don't, let, let me explain why they're not quite trees. But I, I want to say that it's an operator that clicks together a bunch of sub things. And in the first instance, you could, if you just ignore this business, then it's just a bunch of sub trees and you click them together and that's how you form an AST. But ASTs aren't good enough. If you want to be talking about operational semantics, you need to have proper notions of binding and scope. So the idea is that in each argument position, I can bind one or more variables. That's the x1 through xn bar there, which are bound in that argument position. And that's illustrated here, uh, where I have here and I have here are the two binding operators in question in Godel's T. So my idea is that I just have a syntax in which I tell you like this, the types are included among maybe Ts. I write them in infix form. I, I'm, I'm fairly liberal about what I write on the board, but officially everything is in is our terms in a logical framework that I have in mind. So that's what's happening. So, okay, so that's the idea. So here's the syntax. I have zero and successor. I have a recursor, which is the functional programming analog of a for loop. So the idea is I'm gonna run something as many times as you say here with some natural number as I'll explain. And I will iterate with this clause and that will be the base case. So that's what's happening. And then I have Lambda extraction and application and everything is identified up to alpha equivalent. So here is a, here's a point that I'm kind of expecting you, uh, let me not do that, uh, kind of point that I'm expecting you to get, which is you're supposed to understand what it means to identify things up to renaming of bound variables and what is mentioned by capture avoiding Oh, that's a little nasty thing that happens to me. Let me uh, undo my eraser there. I didn't, what's going on here? All right, uh, as I want to do uh, capture avoiding simultaneous substitution. So that's the, the thing that I'm interested in here. If you don't know what that is, it's spelled out in the book and you ought to learn that I can't spend. This is an example where I have to kind of blow through certain things, just tell you what they are. So I take all of the, uh, all of the pieces of abstract syntax are really, alpha equivalence classes. And when I write down a particular one, I'm choosing a representative. And then implicitly, I always choose the representative to be as convenient as possible. That way I don't ever have to worry about things like capture and stuff. So that's the entire idea. Another use for alpha equivalence is to model perfect, perfect encryption. And I'll get back to that a little bit later uh, where we can talk about security applications. If you set it up properly, I'll show you how to do that. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna work at uh, defining what the statics is and I'm gonna put everything in what I'm gonna call local form because this is the briefest thing and it's the closest thing to, uh, to what happens when you write them down on a logical framework. What it means is that I'm gonna use turnstiles here and there, but not everywhere, okay? Because what I'm doing and what's gonna be explained on the next slide is I'm defining an entailment relation or consequence relation that gamma, the assumptions that are rep represented in gamma, which are the assumptions that I will use are the typings of variables. So those are the only forms of assumptions I will use right now. And the order of which doesn't matter. So that's what it means modulo. God, that's annoying. Okay, what, that's what it means by modulo order. I have this double click thing. And when I touch my pen twice by accident, it switches to like erase. So that's what keeps happening to me. I should probably turn that off if I knew how to do it. Um, okay, so so that's what we're doing. And I'm writing down a local order. I bother to mention an assumption only when it's needed. So I write that down here. So what's implicit is I'm writing a gamma everywhere you see. Okay, that's what's implicit. Everything is defined naturally or uniformly in an implied gamma because I can't be bothered to write all that down. It's too, too tedious to do that. The purpose of the logical framework is to get rid of all that tedium. The thing I wanna get across, which I'll explain in the next slide, is there are some requirements for what you're doing when you're, you, you have to earn the privilege to write a turnstile. That's what I'm going to insist on. You don't get to just write down turnstile for anything you feel like, okay? So I, there's absolute meaning for this. So I, I'll explain it. So right now I just tell you the variables have the type that you assume they do. Uh, zero, which I've written like that, and successor I've written are natural numbers. They take natural numbers to natural numbers. The recursor, as I mentioned before, compute something of type tau as a function of a natural number. 
you tell it what the base case is, you tell it how to proceed inductively, I'll show you the dynamics, and then you'll see, uh, uh, you'll see how that works. Um, so that's what I'll, what I'll do there. And then I have function application lambda abstraction. So I'm assuming these kinds of things are minimally familiar to you. Okay, so as I've emphasized, it's presented all in local form. There's an there's a implicit ambient context. The, the, the things that are going on uh, in, the, in the surrounding context are, is implicit. So in particular, I could write all the rules with horizontal, just horizontally. I don't need those horizontal lines and stuff. It's not necessary, but I do need iterated turn style. And if you want to know about this, then there's something called the LF logical framework. Uh, and that explains how all of this works. You really ought to know about logical frameworks because people these days present so many formalisms. It's the right way to do it and there's no better way. And that's all there is to it. I will assert that even though this is my work, but I will claim that we have 30 years of experience. That's the right way, right way thing to go. What's so important about using a logical framework? It guarantees that the turn still behaves the way it's supposed to behave. And what does that mean? Well, in order to, the requirement is this, is that whenever you write down anything that you call a typing rule, it has to obey. So here I'm kind of telling you how to avoid things that would be in the category of silly mistakes. So you're writing down some language, there's some things you really should not do. Or to put it in affirmatively, you should make sure that the following conditions hold. Otherwise you are not defining a notion of entailment. If you're not defining a notion of entailment, I don't know what you're doing. I would just say, would you please not use a turn file? That's basically uh, what I'm trying to ask for here. So the critical idea is that you should have reflexivity. The intuition is that if I leave aside, uh, oh, sorry about that, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let me clear that, try again. If I leave off the, this part, what I'm saying is tau entails tau. Think of tau as a proposition. If you assume it, it's true. That's uh, all that's going on here, except I'm giving a name to the assumptions or the evidence that it's true. And the other important thing is substitution. If I assume that I, oops, uh, it's just exactly what you learned in school. If I assume that I, uh, if I have a variable in play and I have something of a type and I have a variable, which is an assumption, if I have actually something of that type, then it better be the case that if I plug it in, that it continues to have that type. This in logic is called the cut rule or it's called transitivity. It's also called transitivity. It sort of says, if tau one is true and assuming tau one, tau two is true, then tau two is true outright because I can get rid of the assumption. You could also call it the lemma rule. There's lots of names you could use for it. I'm stressing this because I want to make sure that you understand what, you're, what, what the game is that you're entering. Okay, like what it is you're, you're supposed to think about when you see these things. Okay, the other thing I'm not gonna stress right here that can be made to fall out of substitution are weakening, contraction, and permutation. So the idea, as I said previously, modulo order. I don't care about the order of things. So that's what permutation is. The order of the assumption doesn't matter. When I get to dependent types, it does, but let's not worry about that right now. And then contraction says, if I have two assumptions, I can squish them of the same thing. I can squish them into one. And weakening says I can have assumptions that I don't bother use. Okay, so there's no requirement that I use any variable that I have in scope. If it's in scope, good. You can use it, good. If you wanna use it, good for you. You wanna use it twice, oh, that's fine too, okay? That's what I mean by weakening and contraction. Every variable can be used zero or more times, including zero. Uh, Stephanie, amongst others, I'm not sure who else, will talk about substructural logics in which these principles, ah, which these principles are in fact defeasible. Those can be those can be eliminated, but I'm not going to do that here. Okay, so that's important thing. Okay, good. And now if we write down like T plus plus, so this is Gödel T. He invented this with a little functional programming language. And he invented this a long time ago in order to calibrate the class of functions that's definable in first order arithmetic. You don't need to care about that. But what he did was realize that there is a nice way to interpret things in terms of programs and the programs run. So here's a way in which I can specify how programs run. I'm gonna do this in a slightly tricky way because I have ulterior motives that won't be, become apparent today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to postulate the way I'm gonna explain what it means to run things is I'm just gonna write down what you might be familiar with, which are called beta and eta axioms that come from lambda calculus. So I'm just gonna write down these things as equations. I'll explain about directing them and turning that into an execution model later. But for right now, let me just say, I write down certain equations have to be true, this equational theory. So for example, if I run the recursor on zero, I get back the base case, that's what's being said here. If I run it on E plus one, then what I'm gonna do is run E1, the body, 
but the recursive call X is replaced by the recursive call on the predecessor. That is, this is E plus one, then I'm running it on E. So the, I can run the, the same computation on the predecessor if I use X within E1, that's the idea. So I can just write it out very simply like that. So these are just the beta rules. The natural numbers, which are in play here because the principal argument to the limb form is a natural number. The natural numbers um, are an example of what's called a positive type. If you know anything about polarity in type theory and logic, it's important. With positive types, I can only ever, for practical purposes, I'm, I'm telling certain white lies, but I will say you can only ever, with knowing that that's a little white lie, asterisk, ever worry about the what are called the beta principles. How do we take an elimination applied to an intro, elimination applied to an intro form? That's the, that's the idea. Whereas with the negative connective, such as arrow, I can have both an, a, a beta rule and also a unicity rule, a uniqueness rule. That comes back a little bit later. Okay, one way to think about this, let me just mention it, you know it. So if you apply lambda, what do you do? You plug it in. It's the most elementary thing. It's what you learned literally in elementary school. When you wrote down a polynomial, it was lambda abstracted on the variable and you plugged in for X and you calculate. That's exactly what is being said here. And then there's this idea of the uniqueness. Everything of function type is in fact a lambda because you can just uh, lambda abstract by X and apply it to X. You can sort of make its argument explicit. So that's called the eta rule, which is also called uh, a uniqueness or unicity principle. Okay, that's what has happened here. And this is called an inversion principle using Gensen's terminology from proof theory. Okay, now, if I go back to NAT, why do I not have eta rules for NAT? Well, one way to say it is, well, the whole premise of natural numbers is that there's more than one. So I can't say they're all like zero, and I can't say they're all successors because neither of those things is true. So I don't want to do anything like the eta rule. Whereas with the negative types, there's only one way to form it is the lambda. And then I can say, well, you know, as a matter of fact, the way I can tell you there's only a way to form it is I can just say everything is lambda. So that's what I'm doing. So that's all that's happening here. Okay, I'm gonna need that idea of equational theory later if I get to dependent types, that's my reason for doing this. So I'll explain that here. Now, if you're worried about how, how, how to run things, then I will give you a quick explanation of how you might run them. And this is another example of an inductive definition. And this is really derived from Marx and Liff's most famous and influential paper called Constructive Mathematics and Computer Programming. Uh, and this is from the first draft that I have handwritten is 1976. I think it got published in 1982, if I'm not mistaken. You can find, find that paper by Per Marx and Liff, who's the founder of constructive type theory. I mean, he's the guy who gave us our lives, you might say, uh, in a certain sense, because he, uh, yeah, he, and he, and in this paper, he elucidated the connection between programming languages and type theory, which back in the day was like weird and wonderful. And I can regale you of stories over beer about going to Popple and people like condemning you because you're talking about types because there's nothing more irrelevant than types, a completely stupid idea and why you're even talking about that. You are from a different generation. You're like, well, what are you even talking about? The entire subject is type theory. Correct. But it took, uh, it took decades to get that through, uh, even a popple. So you used to have to apologize for writing inference rule on a slide when you were gave a talk of popple. I swear to God, that's true. Okay. And then you had to worry about getting flamed to death by certain people. <laughs> One of my favorite people in the world who I won't name said, I'm interested in every aspect of programming language except for types. That's what he told me when I met him. So um, I proved him wrong. <laughs> That's why I won't name him. Okay, so, so there's, here's a way to evaluate things. I define, I tell you what are the values and when are things, and how do we evaluate? Very simple-minded thing. And I give it by an inductive definition. It's an inductive definition says, well, the relation I'm defining, I should have said this earlier, the relation I'm defining is this least set of pairs in the case of EV, that are closed under these rules. That is, it must contain everything. Every one of these rules has to be contained under these rules. And, oh, I should have put one more rule, uh, which I kind of forgot here. So let me do that, which would be if V is a value, then it evaluates to itself. I forgot that one. That's sort of the, the base case, if you will, of, the, uh, of an evaluation rule. So 17 is 17, there's nothing more to do. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay, so you just write them down. So 
how do I evaluate an application? I evaluate the function, and then I plug in the argument for the bound variable and I evaluate that. Yes, I'm using here what is called a call by name interpretation. As homework, you can do it for call by value. Figure out what call by value even means in the setting and try to do it for call by value. You will have two independent choices. You will have a choice of what to do here. That will come up. And you will have a choice about what to do here. That will come up. So you should think about doing that. OK, and then so that's how you evaluate an application. How do I evaluate a recursion? Well, I have to evaluate the thing I'm recurring on. And if it happens to be 0, then I do whatever E0 said. I wrote dot, dot, dot here. I didn't feel like writing out the E0 x dot E1 over and over. Uh, so E0 is there. Evaluate the base case. Otherwise, you evaluate, you do the substitution instance I referred to earlier, evaluate that when E is a predecessor, right, is a successor of E prime, and I run it on E prime. So that's a prime there. So that's a simple way of doing it. So it's a lot like a for loop. If you just keep counting down, that's all. You keep counting down every time you do another, another copy of E1. So it's very, very straightforward. OK, good. Now, here's something you can prove that I'm not going to prove uh, for you at the board today. Uh, I decided because I have other axes to grind, which is uses the theory of logical relations. You're going to need that here. This is not going to be easy for you to prove. Here's a really nice exercise for you. It's a really fun homework exercise. You can work it out. This theorem says, if I have a closed term E, so this is closed, I could, if I wanted to write down, oops, I used epsilon for an empty context, I'm pretty sure. So this means it's typed in the empty context. So it's closed. So I'll emphasize that this is closed. Those are the only things we run. I want to say every closed expression has a value. Moreover, if you take the equations I stated, you'll be able to show that that expression is equal to its value. You can do the calculation like you did in elementary school with polynomials. You could evaluate them by equational deduction. So that's what I'm saying here. This may seem self-evident to you. In a certain way, it is self-evident. But uh, you're going to have a hell of a hard time proving it, of course, unless you already know about logical relation. So here's a really nice exercise here. I think it's really fun, which is to try to prove this theorem, just this one. Try to prove that theorem, that if E is of type tau, then it evaluates to a value V for some V. You should do it. You should really should do it. The only possible strategy is to go by induction on typing because the typing relation is inductively defined as the least binary relation or ternary relation closed under the rules with gamma and turn cell and E. Okay. I take the smallest one. Therefore, I need to show that uh, this property that all uh, obeys, that all of the rules, this property is closed under all the typing rules. You just look at the premise of each rule and you try to prove that this is the case and then try to derive from the premises, the inductive hypotheses, you try to derive that you can get that the conclusion evaluates the, to, to V. So for example, one of the rules back here, where did it go? Uh, uh, back here uh, tells us that zero is a natural number and it evaluates to itself because it's defined to be a, it's defined to be a value somewhere or other there. It's defined to be a value. So it evaluates to itself and therefore its value has type nat. Oh, good, so that one was really easy. As soon as you get to things that involve a variable, however, you're going to find yourself in trouble. OK, and what I want you to do is think about how you might prove this theorem. And then I'll come back to it, if you like, because it's a super useful exercise to carry out for yourself. So what is it an exercise in? Strengthening the IH. You should be really good in strengthening the IH. You can, if you're careful, I've set this up for you, so that it's not too hard to figure out what you have to do to strengthen the IH. So I'm not going to say any more than that. So you're going to have to prove something stronger than this. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to introduce a property. We'll call it R of E. So, or I could call it P for predicate. If I, in the case here, it would be R of E1 and E2, a binary relation. But I'm going to have either a unary or binary relation. And the idea is going to be is, it, is it's, it's going to have to be a bridge between. So what you're going to do is you're going to go from E colon tau you're going to go up to this property, P, it's going to be P tau of E, or you could write a P E tau. It's indexed by the type tau. That's the critical thing, OK? The critical thing, so this is defined for things of type tau. And then this will be enough to tell us there exists a V and E evaluates the V. OK, at the, that's what's, what's going to happen. So this is your strengthened IH. And I'll give you a hint which is that P tau of E is defined by induction on tau. 
That is, in this case, you're going to define P nat, and you're going to define P tau one arrow tau two in terms of P tau one and P tau two. Because you those have already been defined, and then you make make the arrow. So you're going to need that. And then the nat has to be defined outright because that's an atomic type. There's no no constituent types there. So you're going to have to do this. IH equals inductive hypothesis, yes. So uh, I just noticed that somebody mentioned that. So I write it out, strengthen inductive hypothesis, which I will almost always write IH. Okay, so this is what you're going to do and see if you can do that. It's a very good exercise. Uh, you will learn a tremendous amount. And it's not, that, it's not all that hard. Just keep your wits about you. There's a series of things you have to discover as you go along. I'll just leave that alone for the time being. Okay, good. So that's my starting point, is working with uh, what is called Gödel T. The, uh, uh, I don't know why he called it T, but I, re I only recently learned something that I probably should have known a really long time ago, which is that the reason Girard called his system F is because Gödel called his T. Ooh, it's actually kind of a bad joke. I only recently learned this. And as soon as somebody told me this, I thought, how did I never think of that? Because I never knew why is it called system F? Well, because Gödel was called T. All right, that's the, and the point was that Girard was extending Gödel's ideas to a richer logic, to second order logic. That was the idea. And the purpose of his formalism was to deal with similar issues to what Gödel was dealing with, except to do it with, uh, to do it for uh, uh, second order. Uh, logical systems. Okay, good. So now what I want to do, okay, so good. I should pause to see if there are any questions of what we've been doing so far. I realize I'm, I'm going at a clip, but I, uh, I'm trying to draw the, uh, trying to find, I'm trying to find a middle ground here where I'm not losing you, but I am interesting and intriguing you enough that you're going to be annoyed and say, well, let me go figure out what he's talking about. So that's my goal. Okay, so please uh, ask ask questions, we'll take a moment to do this. <clears throat> None whatsoever, okay. Everybody knows all this already? Can you explain the, the TF joke? I didn't really get it. I wanted to ask the same question, yes. I would imagine it to be you, right? So it's to be custom you because you come to after T. Yeah, that comes later, uh, that's another, that's another issue, but uh, yeah. Anyway, true and false, that's the joke. Oh, I haven't okay, asked, okay. I, have, I have not asked John Eve personally whether that's true, but it has to be. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Why did you go to call a team? I think it was eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which is in fact the answer that Alonzo Church gave in a written mail to somebody who asked him why it was called Lambda in the Lambda calculus. That was his answer. <laughs> So anyway, we're all used to Lambda. It's like a privileged, privileged symbol. Okay, when is a relation defined over terms logical? When it's defined by induction on the structure of type. So I, I noticed that I was scribbling here. So, so let me cut and be a little less scribbly. So you're gonna define P nat or if it's a binary relation, but here is a predicate you have to define outright. And then you're given the predicate for tau one and the predicate for tau two, and then you define the predicate for tau one arrow tau two in terms of those. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So when they're defined by induction and structure of type, they're called logical relations. They go by a whole bunch of different names. They're called logical relations or logical predicates. We don't bother to distinguish logical relations, we'll say. Or they're also called, and now this is confusing, they're called computability predicates. Why is it confusing? Because, well, it's not computability like in the sense of computability theory, really. But anyway, that's what Tate called them in 1968. So it's called the computability method sometimes. They're also called reducibility. That's a little better name, I think. And they're also called... Uh, I think I'm missing, I'm missing uh, another common term for them, but you'll see these words, uh, logical relation, computability method, 
uh, reducibility method, Tate's method, uh, all these words will come up and it's the foundation for everything. And if you look at uh, Martin Luth's highly influential prescient paper, Constructive Math and Computer Programming, it's all spelled out there. And you can have a look at that. That's one of, from a CS point of view, is one of the most important papers of all time, if you ask me, uh, because it made the connection between Constructive Math and Computer Programming. And you have to understand that in 1976, especially, Constructive math was considered some deviant obsession of some weird philosophers, and those people should be ignored. And and nobody even dreamed of anything to do with computer programming. And then it started to dawn on people in the 1970s. And uh, Martin Luff's one of the key players in that. So okay, so so that's where this that's one of the origins of this idea. In fact, Martin Luff, as far as I read the historical record. Martin Luff was highly influenced by Tate who invented the idea of logical relation. I had a very nice conversation once with Tate about discovering it. It was a, a pleasure. He's a nice guy to get a chance to know him. He's retired at the University of Chicago. Okay, so good. So that's, uh, that's what you need to do. And if we wanna come back to it another time, I can do that. Okay, other questions. Ah, so the other thing I wanna say, when you define this outright, I should have said this before because this is another. This is another another important point, and it's inductively defined in terms of itself. So the way I like to think of this is that there's a sort of vertical induction, where you have on the vertical axis you have the type tau, you have nat and then nat or nat and nat or nat or nat, etc. You're building them up structurally, and then there's a horizontal axis, and when you're defining the predicate for nat you do a horizontal induction. It's inductively defined in and of itself. When you define the relation for arrow, you define it in terms of the previously given p tau one and p tau two. So the induction is vertical in this regard. So I think of the method as using both horizontal and vertical. If you have trouble with this one, that's okay. I'd be very happy to tell you how to do that easily. But after all, it's characterizing the behavior, the termination behavior of things of natural number type. So you could imagine it involves some kind of an inductive argument. Okay, uh, that's enough for now. And I can come back to that another time. So that's how you how you would prove something like this. And by something uh, a tiny bit fancier, so this is what I was outlining you would do. And by being a little bit fancier, you can actually prove that you can deduce the value of any expression. Okay, so that's that's what happens when you're in this very simple setting. Okay, that is you only have uh, functions and natural numbers and the, comp the way you compute with natural numbers, you have to count up to n. So it's intuitively clear, but you'll be surprised how difficult it is to prove. It's intuitively clear that you can't write any infinite loops, but try to prove it. Very, very instructive. Okay, so that's what I, what I want you to do here. Okay, now the next thing which I wrote here is exercises, but I can amplify because I don't want to completely lose you, I just want to intrigue you, is we can extend this and what I mean by T plus plus and for reasons of what I need, future things I need in the future, I would suggest that we, that you consider or we consider as we do it here, uh, the extension with products, which is another example of a negative type and also with sums, which is in some sense, the canonical example of a positive type. So you have the flavor, so I'll say, this is somehow comparable to nat, and this is somehow comparable to arrow. That's what I, what is going to happen here. Okay, what do I mean by a negative type and a positive type? Well, the idea is the following, uh, if I wanna say that briefly. The idea about a negative type is if I go back here, well, let's just say, it, I'll, I'll just put it up here. So negative means that the alim form determines is primary. You see, and positive means that the intro forms are primary. That may not help you very much, but here's, here's, what, I, here's what it means in computer science terms. So I wanna write this, okay? So that's a good rule of thumb. What do you mean by positive and negative types? Positive types are characterized by what goes into it. So natural numbers, zero and successor of another one. That's what you care about. And then the recursor is parasitic on that back. Okay, get, I hope you can get the feeling. 
With negative types, you don't care what the thing actually is. You only care that you know how to run it. You know how to call it, you know how to apply it. So what is that doing for you? If you think in terms of a negative type, like arrow being negative, what it means is it builds in a foreign function interface. The whole idea of an FFI, which sounds like some horrible, nasty engineering mess, is actually built right into the semantics of type theory in the sense that nobody cares what a function really is. All you care about is it obeys a column return sequence. So it inherently open-ended and accommodates foreign function interface. If you're ever studying any computability theory, then that's where oracles come in. Okay, if you've ever studied oracles, maybe, maybe not. But I like to think of it in terms of an FFI, it's sort of nice. One, one thing that's kind of nice about type theory is I can point to all the spots where like all sorts of crufty but important engineering issues are handled by the theory. That's the like really beautiful thing about, about type theory is it handles everything okay, in a very nice way. Okay, good. So products, I can explain to you what I mean, but the idea is going to be, uh, we have binary products, so the set of ordered pairs, if you will, or the type of ordered pairs, where you have a component from tau one and a component from tau two. And if I have an ordered pair, I can, I write E.1 and E.2 to project out the left and right components. Okay, get them back. And if you now think what's important in, in type theory, very often I should be using the ephemeral that, that so that it goes away. Okay, so we have order pair and we have projection. And when you, whenever you're in type theory, when you, in situations like this, you wanna be careful to account for not only the binary case, but you wanna also account for the nullary case, the case where you don't have a, pro we have a product of no things. So just like in arithmetic, a product of no things is the multiplicative unit. One, okay, so that's what's going on here. And it contains only one element, which is normally written the null tuple because it's the ordered, uh, well, n tuple, the ordered zero tuple. And you can see right there, all zero elements, uh, components are right there in front of you. So I write open, open uh, and close angle bracket. Okay, that's what's going on there. So you could write those down. You can look them up in PFPL. I don't think it's best use of my time to review that. The thing that I think is important, and I will review with you because it's so important, is the treatment of sums. One of the most characteristic features of languages designed by, and I'm going to have a nice homework exercise for you coming up, so I'll be sure to amplify this. One of the really nice things about languages that are designed on the basis of type theory is they get certain issues correct that no other programming language that people keep flailing around and screwing up decade after decade after decade and never learn which is that common programming languages, in particular, all of the object-oriented languages, completely screw this up and don't give you sums. And yet it's like one of the most important concepts in programming. Any of you who have ever written any ML code or Haskell code know this perfectly well. It's totally dead obvious. However, the rest of the world goes along with null pointers and some other horseshit, which is, uh, is just a testimony to their failure to understand anything about PL theory. So let me emphasize a little bit about sums. So we're going to have binary and nullary sums. So that's important thing here. So we have a binary sum and we have a nullary sum. Because I write the sum with a plus, then naturally enough, the nullary case is gonna be the additive unit and I'll write it as zero. And I'm gonna explain, explain that. And this should have been written, uh, I'll write it two case here and I'll explain myself now in order to be clear be clear with you. Um, I'm being a little bit, uh, explicit here because this is a point where beginners get very confused about sums. It's a bugaboo in programming languages since forever. So I wanna make sure that we that I, I, I'm clear enough on what I'm doing. So what I wanna do is I wanna say, well, if I have an expression of type tau one, then I can inject it. So this is called the injection into the type tau one plus tau two. You can think of this as either a tau one or a tau two, but I can tell you which. So for example, unlike union and sets, nat plus nat is not at all the same thing as nat. I can have two copies of nat. This is an incredibly useful thing to have at your disposal. You have to understand that it's not union like you know what you learn in school about um, uh, what you learn in school about sets. The type, this is an example of types are not behaving the way sets do and the way you've been likely taught to think. So this is not a union. 
Okay. And then I label it with two here. And that's also going to be in tau one plus tau two. Okay. So again, we have the injection into the right, into the right component number two here, which we do that. Another terminology for this injection, which I think is very useful, this is called the class. So in the case of binary sums, there are two classes of value. They're called one and two to be totally boring. But I could give them more interesting names if I want to. And I've done that a moment ago because what I did is I said, Nat, I'll write a wavy equal here. It's more or less equal to, well, let me leave myself some space, one plus Nat. That is a natural number is either zero, which I'm gonna use this notation. I'm gonna give a name instead of forcing you to use one and two, I'll give it a name, zero, or it's the successor, or I wrote it S before, the successor of, a, of another Nat. So therefore, Z dot the null tuple, that's what we call zero. Okay, and successor of E dot, this is the dot here, the injection is, uh, well, E plus one, if you wanna write it out informally. So it's very important that you see how that works. So sums are, 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 are of the essence here, like something we have to be really, really careful about, okay? And whether we give names to the sum ends, that's definitely a convenience. But for abstract purposes, I can just use one and two. It just makes, makes Blackboard life a little bit easier. That's the idea. So if I have two possibilities, then what is the, uh, of creating a value of some type, then what do I do? I'll write it two case. I have a reason for doing that. And I'm gonna write it like this. And I could label it with a tau. And the idea is that if you give me an element of the sum type, then what can I do with that guy? Well, I can branch on which sum and is it in because it's either in the left or it's in the right. If it's in the left, then E1 takes care of that and computes a tau out of the left-hand data. And if it's in the right, then E2 computes a tau out of the right-hand data. And now you've covered everything. And the important point of this is it's exhaustive. And I'm gonna give you a nice homework exercise that will drill home the importance of this exhaustiveness condition. In other words, there are two possibilities here and the case analysis covers both of them. A way of saying it is, if I omitted one of those cases, it's an error. Why is that such a good thing? Well, my exercise is gonna, uh, gonna amplify that for you, but the idea is the following thing. So remember, we think of one and two as the classes of data, two classes of data. Suppose I say, oh, I'm revising the program. And what used to be tau one plus tau two, I'm now gonna make tau plus tau three. And now the type checker, if you've ever used ML or Haskell or something, will tell you all and only the places in your program that you must revise in order to account for this change. This is the biggest boon in the history of software engineering. Okay, I'm being really cheeky in saying that, but all right, I am. Because you can. It is you the can, most important idea. Is it because you can yeah. essentially, uh, you know, maintain your code and keep changing it as you as you wish? That's uh, without without having to worry about re read the whole thing. That's what you mean from practical perspective. Yeah, because if I gave them names, class one plus class two, plus class three, the the old code was expecting these two. Right. Now it has to expect a third one, and the compiler will tell you exactly the spots where you care. Yes. Okay. If the world would only understand this one point, it would life would be so much better for all of us. <laughs> okay. But anyway, that's the way it is. It's been very difficult to get this across. Why? Because OOP, which I'm going to say something about in a minute, took over the world in the 1990s for some goddamn reason. And, and now we're stuck with it. And whatever its virtues, it has tremendous vices. And uh, so this is one of them. You don't have sums. Okay, so the point is it's exhaustive. And then if I want to talk about its equational behavior, if I want to say how it behaves, and then I can say something about the zero okay? So what does two case do? Well, I'm, I'm looking at two cases. I wrote it like that to emphasize that. So if I have one dot E and I have a case, guess what? I have a case for one dot and I have a case for two dot. So maybe I should have called those X1 and X2 just to be emphatic. I don't have to because they're independent bound variables, but it's kind of uh, mnemonic. Okay, so what's the idea? Well, that should be the same as 
E1, except you plug in what you're in the inject from for E1. And then the other thing you do is if I write two dot E here, then it will be dot, 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 and the two dot EK equals uh, E for X E2. So this is in the one dot E case, and this is in the two dot E case. And that's it. Now, if you're not familiar with these things, I want you to contemplate why this is not the same thing as if instance of uh, that you would write in Java or something. The whole idea of instance of is like painfully, painfully, painfully naive and leads to a bazillion bugs in code they use every day. So I don't know whether you probably, you wouldn't have any reason to know this, but I have this black cloud over my head. I pretty much guarantee any piece of software I use, it will break. I go to my bank website and log in and say, click on pay my bills. I get a, a stack back trace with a null pointer exception. I kid you not, okay? This has been going on for decades. I mean, I should make money at this because merely by existing, I make all code break. So, uh, and so I know where these kind of bugs come up and these kinds of things, if you don't have some, that's a really big source of such mistakes. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. And if you want, you can do as an exercise, you can define an evaluation strategy, do that for some, including what I'm gonna write in the next slide. And you can, if you're really ambitious, you can extend that proof I suggested for you to cover sums, it's not hard. You can even cheat, you can look it up in, in Martin Lewis paper. And now let's just go back to the zero -re case. So what about, what about zero, a null -re sum? Well, it has no sum ands, it's the null -re sum. So there's no introductory form. There's no rules that say you have something of type zero. And since there are, then I'm going to have a typing rule that I call it zero case. If I do zero case of E has no branches and magically comes up with something of type tau when E is of type zero. Because you see, it evaluates E, I would say, and, uh, and computes a value of type tau by case analyzing on all zero cases that E could be. So what does this tell you? Well, if I can push through the theorem, if I push through the theorem, if you prove termination for sums, but in particular when you have zero, zero and plus, then what can you conclude? There is no closed term of type zero. There's always variables, but there's no closed expression of type zero. Why of type zero? Well, because if there were one, it would evaluate to what? Well, there's nothing for it to evaluate to. Therefore, the case analysis is always vacuous. So it magically comes up with something of type tau by virtue of the fact that it can never be called. Okay, so that is the idea. So that's the nullary sum. So if you just think of it as the zero or EK, if you just think of it as the binary sum under the assumption that two equals zero, then you'll get it. <laughs> that's the idea. Instead of two, you make it zero, and then you'll just get the right thing. It's super important, as you know, in programming, everybody knows, get the goddamn edge cases right. And moreover, don't make them special cases. Make the edge cases fall out as a as the natural thing to do from the general case. That's the way to write good code. Everyone knows this. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, I have the binary case, I want the edge case to work out. Because in general, I'm gonna have an N case and it's going to have, I'm gonna have E here, and then I'm gonna have N clauses here. And I want that to work out when N equals zero or one or two or whatever you like. So get the boundary case right. That's the whole idea. So. This is an interesting fact. And then I'll make a remark about logic. The propositions as types principle, which was most fully developed by Martin Lowe, tells us that we can identify proofs with programs. It tells us that a proof of a proposition can be considered to be an inhabitant of its type. So if I think of the, the type zero, that's the type that has no elements. In other words, it's the proposition that has no proof. What would be the proposition that has no proof? Falsehood. Falsity by the definition of what falsity is has no proof. 
Okay, so that's the that's the uh, way of connecting this up, connecting this up with logic. So therefore, what is one from logical point of view? Well, it has an element that has no information. So what could it possibly be? It's true without there being any information whatsoever about why it's true. You just vacuously true. true. Vacuously true. That would be truth. Yeah, that would be the trivially true proposition. So we get this correspondence. I guess I should mention this now then, which I think is important, which is misnamed. I will call it the propositions as types principle. So what we get is a correspondence and Martin Luth develops this one. So that's falsehood, that's truth. And then we have something like we have arrow, then we get, well, uh, I will write it with a different letter just to suggest, okay, it's implication. And then what happens with product? Well, that's conjunct, whoops. That's conjunction, because for this to be inhabited means you have an inhabitant of both sides. In other words, they're both true, okay? For this to be inhabited means you have one or the other. You might even have both, but at any moment you're going to commit and tell which one it is. So it's disjunction, and I'll put an asterisk here. We'll get back to that in a moment. All right, what is negation therefore? Well, sorry, we can write here. I'll write something here. I'll write a special case, tau arrow zero corresponds to negation. From the assumption that tau is true, I can derive a contradiction, falsehood. So that's not tau, which is the same as tau implies false. So that like falls out. So it's a very nice thing to get this correspondence with programming. On the other hand, we have types like nat. What in God's name does that mean? Well, nothing. Because you see, logic isn't as comprehensive as programming languages. Because on the PL side, we're concerned not only with the way you write the code, but also the data you act on. And yeah, code is all is data, but there's other kind of data like NAT, and that's not a matter of, of logic. There's nothing in this column. Okay. Uh, another thing that come up when we do dependent types is we might have equations. And what does that correspond over here? At the moment, I can't answer that because I don't have the apparatus. Okay, but I just want to point this out to you. So this is the correspondence that Martin Leff brought out. And uh, there's another version of this, which has to do with continuations, if you know about continuation. I won't have time in these lectures to develop that. Okay, but uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thing that Tim Griffin invented a long time ago in like 1990, 89, 90, I don't remember exactly, uh, somewhere in there. Okay, so that's just a little bit uh, a flavor of the correspondence that you've got these things work. These are the ways in which you know that, uh, 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 yeah, someone makes a remark about abstraction boundaries. I'll come back to that after class. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get back to that. Uh, here with the asterisk, I'm just, I'm not gonna develop this right now. Okay, I'll just leave it. Uh, what I want to do is, what the asterisk means is this. I'll write versus not phi, not, not phi and not phi, uh, phi one and phi two. Those are two different things. That thing and this thing are two different things. Even though in ordinary math, they're considered to be the same, okay? You can prove a disjunction by saying, well, they can't both be false. But in this kind of setting, the primary notion of disjunction, let me use that word, forces you to say which one. And if you want to say they can't both be false, both, by all means do, I, I, there's no problem. But don't confuse them, please. That's the message. The entire idea of constructive math is to make that work. And making that work is totally natural from the point of view of programming. So that's the, that's the link up. That's kind of what I'm telling you about in this lecture, just kind of establishing some groundwork that, uh, that tells you, uh, uh, yeah, establishing some groundwork for that connection. Okay, good. So that's the, uh, the setup uh, for the basic like polynomial types. And now I'm gonna give you a homework assignment that you might enjoy and then I'm going to press on from here. So are there any questions about um, the polynomial types, for lack of a better word? So these 
these things up here for the evident, at least notational reason, if no other reason, these could be thought of as the, for the, the polynomial case, which in logic is called the propositional case. Propositional logic is concerned only with these connectives that I've written here. And on the type theory side, you might call them polynomial if you want, which are, because they sort of look, well, this one is a little questionable, but plus and cross and zero and one certainly are familiar from polynomials. And then the arrow is like general, generalizing, kind of generalization. Let's not worry about that too much. Okay, I put it in scare quotes. So I'm just trying to like make some connections without trying to make very precise claims. I'm doing that consciously just to pique your, pique your interest. Okay, so I'll, I will try to flag when I'm oversimplifying things. Uh, I do that for pedagogical purposes and then I try to say, but be careful I'm oversimplifying. So. I think that's fair. Okay, good. So any other, uh, I did mention dependent types, but I'm not there yet. Okay, so uh, good. Uh, any questions so far? So from a PL point of view, the thing I would just like to say is what makes Haskell or ML interesting, I'll let, let me say half of, well, I'll speak very loosely. Half of what makes them interesting is sums. That's it. Okay, that's, that, that's it. Okay, another part of it is their functional programming languages, which has a dual meaning. One is it has to do with not having effects or controlling effects, which I'll explain a little later. And the other has to do with being able to push functions around as data. That's hugely powerful. Okay. If you want to make a comparison, um, why NAT don't exist in logic? Well, I don't want to say NAT don't exist in logic. I simply wanted to say there's a type which isn't isn't naturally, <laughs> for lack, excuse the pun, isn't naturally construed as a proposition like nat, that's data. Okay, it's not, it's not a theorem. It's not something you would write down in a theorem statement, nat. <laughs> no, that's data. If I had string, you know, that would be data. Okay, I can't like make, a, I don't wanna make giant thing, but I'm just trying to point out that there are more types in the world than there are things that arise from logic. That is for sure. So, uh, so the another perspective on constructive math, which is informing this, is that you start with computer programming. The whole idea of a proof is a program, and now you build up logic on the basis of writing code. That's the that's the whole idea, and from that point of view, computer math is a branch of computer science. At least if you're working constructively. Rather than thinking of like theoretical computer science as a branch of math, it turns it on its head and said, no, all you mathematicians, you're just doing computer programming, you don't know it. And the rise of type theory as the foundation for mechanized mathematics is proof positive that this is the correct perspective. So talk to, you know, Georges Gontier or people like that, Tom Hales or Jeremy Avigad, or I don't know, lots and lots of people who do mechanized math at a very serious level. It's all done in type theory. which is all grounded in computer programming. So for me, this is like the coolest thing ever. This is what drove my career. When I was your age or younger, I learned about this. I thought this is the most kick-ass thing I've ever heard. Okay, this is like the best thing ever. And so that's like how I got interested in this. So good. Yeah, so you can stretch the meaning of proposition. So that's a proposition. And I don't wish to quibble about that. I'm simply trying to give you the lay of the land. Okay, there's no, no use in me like insisting on some distinction like that doesn't have any force you know so okay so uh good so that's a uh uh, uh 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 and this I, I will mention is uh very principally developed by paramatum particularly at scale to the scale of like cochlear improver or new pearl system new pearl prover or agda or things like that are all based in type three and are now able to do very serious math and program verification. And it's all based in type theory. So that's why you're supposed to know type theory. That's why, according to me, people who say types are like, I don't want to know about types are irrelevant. I'm looking at them like, I don't know what planet you're from, but it's not mine. Uh, it's a very, uh, I feel like doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But okay, there you go. I'll come back, I'll come back to that, uh, come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so here's a 
a fun exercise for you uh, to do, which is, it's, it's, this is in, in PFPL, you can look it up, which is the understanding dynamic dispatch. So dynamic dispatch is the thing, one of the main, like most basic things that is uh, associated with object-oriented programming. The idea is that it's always misrepresented. It, it's misrepresented as you're supposed to be able to somehow dispatch on the type of your data. Well, that's wrong. That's not what's going on. It's the wrong, not the type. What you're doing is you're having, <clears throat> you're classifying your data with different, with uh, a variety of classes. That's the sum type. And then you're going to associate some functionality, some behavior with all possible choices. That is all possible instances of the classes we have around. So I want to define, they're called methods in this case, of, for whatever reason, functions, procedures, methods, whatever. So I want to have functions that can respond to an instance of any class of data that I have on, have on the table. So the idea then is the following. You can read about this in the PFPL to get the background. But the idea is I'm going to make something what I call the dispatch matrix. Oops, I'm going to undo that. I'm going to do, I'm going to, to try to do this. So I'm going to, this is what is called the dispatch matrix. So the example that I, that I use in the book, uh, which is uh, convenient for the purposes I have at hand, is I have, in the book, I have two classes, which are uh, points in the plane in rectangular and polar representations. So these are my two classes. So I have a point in the plane and there are two forms of them, rectangular and polar. The type is point, the classes are rectangular and polar. And in each case, they take two arguments. It's just that when I mark it, so that, notice that the way this works out is you get R squared, R squared plus R squared. You get two copies of R squared because you either have X, Y in the sense of rectangular, or you have, you know, it's usually written row, row theta or something, right? Uh, in the case of polar, but however you write it, there's still pairs of real numbers. So what you need is the class to distinguish them because otherwise you don't know, it's just a pair. Three, four, what is that supposed to mean? Is that the X and the Y or the row and the theta? Well, you mark them. So you would, if you wanted to make that explicit, you'd say, I have a rectangular point which takes two real numbers uh, or I have a polar point which takes two real numbers. And then I have, uh, I have two so-called methods or operations and I, they're called uh, distance squared and quadrant. Okay, given a point in the plane, tell me it's squared distance from the origin and given a point in the plane, tell me which quadrant it's in, in the sense of, yeah, in the sense of the coordinate system you have at hand. Okay, so these are two operations. And the idea is that I wanna make all of the operations work on all of the representations. So what I have is a matrix that says, the ijth entry of the matrix is the behavior of the jth method on the ith class. So the behavior of distance squared on polar, the behavior of distance squared on rectangular, the behavior of quad on rectangular, the behavior of quad on polar. That's it. So I give a square matrix. I've forgotten which way I wrote it in the book. So I, I'll, I'll guess and say that the vertical axis was the class and the horizontal axis, oops, uh, access is the methods. And then you have to fill in the square. You have to say, what do you do in that case? What is the distance for rectangular squared? Well, it's, you know, X squared plus Y squared. And here it's rho and et cetera. So you fill these things out, okay? So abstractly, that's the scenario. And now here's the fun part. You can reorganize this data. If you use the equational theory I gave, this is one of the reasons I gave you equations, is that this type, this type, and this type are isomorphic, meaning I can write mutually inverse functions that go back and forth, okay? That's the idea. And here's what I can do. What I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I'm gonna represent the data in the dispatch matrix in two ways. I'm going to say, well, I'm gonna call the, I'm gonna call the, the items in question, we'll call them objects because that's what they're called. And there are two ways of thinking about objects. You can think of it as a tuple of methods, which is a common one that people try to encourage, 
or you can think of it as a tag density theta. And the isomorphism is saying it's all the same. So what's happening is, uh, if I put in the parens here, what's happening is I can reorganize this data by currying it. I can say, well, it's a product of, for each class, give me instance data for that class. Then I will give you back all the methods and how they act for that particular uh, form of instant data. So for rectangular, I tell you what quad and distance are. And for polar, I tell you what quad and distance are. That's this direction. Alternatively, I can think of an object as tagged instance. What the object is, is a sum of instant data. That is the object is either rect dot, you know, x, y, or it's polar dot, you know, rho theta as we usually write it. Okay, so this is the sum that's going on here. And then what happens is the methods have to dispatch dynamically on the tag to tell you how to compute their answer. Quad, this is J, capital J here is either quad or distance squared. So it tells you how to do the quadrant or the distance squared for each possible choice of point, which is a sum. Or I can do it the other way around. I can say, give me you know, what your instance data is. And when I do a new, I will emit a tuple of methods that are particular to that instance. Boom, that's the idea. So this is a, a correspondence. And if you look at it, it's exactly analogous to the following logical correspondences, since I'm also mentioning logical correspondences. Let me put those in. So the idea is that I'll just write it out in the, the most elementary form possible. Let me think for a moment what I want to do so that I can don't confuse myself. So I want to write out something like this. I'll do it with a square matrix. Phi one implies psi one and phi two implies psi two. That, no, that isn't what I wanted to say. Uh, what is it I want to say here? I have dispatch matrix, I have this, and I want to have, oh yeah, right. So I want to have, the data I have is phi one implies psi one, phi two implies psi, uh, psi one, and then the other way around. Phi one implies psi two, uh, phi two implies, oops, uh, psi two. Yeah, good. So this is, this is in, in logical terms. I'm putting in a matrix, so I'm making a big conjunction of these facts. Okay, so I have those facts. And then I can organize them in different ways, okay? So what I can do is I can say, I have either a phi one or a phi two, oops, make that an or, psi two. And then that implies, well, phi one and, or and, that's a way to organize this data. The disjunction implies phi, uh, psi, I wrote a psi over here, sorry. Psi one, and this would be psi two. Okay, that's, uh, that's one way to do it, one representation. But another representation is just the other way around, is I, I, I say, well, I have phi one arrow psi one and phi two arrow psi two, or I can do it like this, uh, phi one and psi one and psi two. And phi two implies psi one and psi two. And if I didn't confuse myself and write the wrong thing, there is a correct thing to write here that looks like this. And these are all equivalent, all logically equivalent. So what this means is that there's no there's no difference between writing. In, the, in, in representation two, the first part bracket, is it phi one implies psi one and psi two? Uh, is that a typo? Okay, okay I don't know uh, what I what I did here. I I did this. Uh, yeah, I think I wrote it right. Is this where you're asking? Was here? Uh, in representation two, the uh, no no in representation two, uh, you were. Yeah. Yeah, it one. says if you have if you have a phi one, you can give me both of these, and if you have a phi two, you can give me both of these, and you have both of that information. Uh, the problem That's is second. Okay, maybe because maybe. if I have if I have all of this data, then I can reorganize it in the following way: assume phi one from here, get a psi one from here, get a psi two, and then also I can assume a psi two, and then from here I can get a psi one, and here a psi two, and that's what I'm doing. And I'm having oh, both he's, you have a slight typo. He's saying oh, the second thing should be psi, not phi. The, the first yeah. conjunct, second 
in the conclusion. Oh, uh, oh, okay, yeah. That, see, I can't even. What happens to you when you're standing at the board? What happens to you when you're standing? What happens to you when you're standing at standing at the board is you can't even see something like that. It's just like uh, the way the way it goes. Someday you'll find yourself in that position. Okay, sorry about that. I wasn't able to see your point. It's just what happens. Okay, so my point is that the organization of whether you want to think of it in terms of you know projecting from an object the method or injecting the data into the class. Well, I, I don't you know to, to form the object. I don't care. There's nothing special about that. Okay, you can do it either way. Now the question comes up though, which I ask you to contemplate. So one is to work out, work out these correspondences, show how to go from here to here and here to here and backward. Not that hard. It's written in the book, but you can you can mess with it. It's a programming exercise. Very, very easy thing to do. So it's worth seeing that you can reorganize things in this way in particular move all those over there or move them all over here. And notice that the product becomes a sum when it's on the left-hand side of the arrow. Okay, so that's important. So you can write your code in, in either form and you know you can transform, transpose between them as you wish. Now a question becomes, what happens to you now when you evolve the code? What happens to you if I add more additional classes? Or what happens to you if I add additional methods? That's the thing to consider. This organization is going to be really good for you when you add additional classes, because it's going to tell you which methods violate it, which ones have to be revisited, because they weren't able to account for the additional sum and. So you're going to get that check. Now I'll ask you, what is the analogous thing that falls out of this in the case of methods? I don't want to say. There's a notion of evolution that falls out nicely from this formulation. Yeah, I don't know. What is the analogous thing to adding more classes, I want you to think about what you should do with methods and what is it, what is this organization doing for you in that scenario? So this organization helps you if you add more classes, what does this organization do for you? It does something important for you in terms of code evolution. I want you to, I want you to elucidate that because what I'm trying to get you to do is I'm trying to get you to think of programming problems in terms of type structure because it's a tremendously useful thing to do um, and very powerful tool. Okay, so that's what I'm going to have you do. Okay, so good, have a look at those things. As I said, the answers are all available. So really just take it as fun and heck around with it and enjoy it. I hope you'll enjoy it, it's like do it like that. And you can look up the answers and we can talk about it uh, afterwards as well. Yes, it smells of the expression problem, yes it does. Uh, but the expression, yeah, this is the right way to formulate it in terms of sums and products. It's, to be, it's about sum and product types. Otherwise, it's a big yawn. But anyway, let's not worry about that. Okay, so, okay, good. So now the, uh, what did I want to say here? Okay, so that finishes T++. So the features of T++ is, the main thing is that everything is total. Total, that is, it terminates. And it's pure. There are no notions of any kind of side effect. Well, I'll say what I mean by that in a minute. Everything is total and pure. One corollary is that the order of evaluation doesn't matter. Whether you do call by value or call by name, evaluation is immaterial. It's not going to matter. So that's why I emphasize equational reasoning, because it's nice like that. That's going to be lost immediately but I, I wanted to start out like that. And what I have is, you know, I have product products, sums, function types, and that because Girdle did. You can consider, if you know about such things, the dual of NAT, co-NAT, I don't have time to talk about this, which is co-inductive. NAT is an example of an inductive type. It's the least thing closed under zero and successor. Uh, Conat is dual. It's the greatest thing that's compatible with looking at its head and uh, looking at whether it's zero or not. If you know about that, you could work it out. If you don't, you could look it up uh, in PFPL or the notes, uh, or we could talk about it, but I, I didn't go into that at the moment. And then I'll just have a warning. Uh, which is you should know about the Blum size there.
So every five years or so, in one context or another, someone invents a programming language whose great feature is everything is total. And therefore, you can't have any infinite loops. Well, first of all, let me just say something about as Edgar Dijkstra one time wrote an essay called something like on the fact that the Atlantic Ocean has two sides. So I'm doing a, I'm doing a version of that. Uh, the situation in Europe and in the US is different. So the one thing I would say is, so we have everything is total. However, people like Rick Statman, that's the MU in the math department, amongst others, have proved theorems that tell you that yeah, 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 everything is total, but the complexity of the termination problem is enormous. There isn't much difference between an infinite loop and something that's gonna take 11 zillion years to terminate. And it's customary in the other side of the Atlantic to ignore that because complexity all that doesn't count. And on, the, on, the, on this side of the Atlantic, it's customary to take account of that. So I would just say, first of all, totality isn't everything because practicality of totality matters a lot, okay? So, all right, enough said about that. But the other thing that I want to say is, uh, there's something called the Blum size theorem. You can look it up. It's uh, discussed in my book. The, the thing you want to, you want to notice is that, I'll put it in quotes, the code incorporates a proof of its own termination. If you're writing in a programming language that has only total functions, then it means you're writing the code in such a way that it's self-evident from type checking that it terminates on all inputs. Let's say it's a function. Well, first of all, think of the collapse conjecture if you know about that. You can't program in Griddle T because you don't know how to prove it. I dare say you don't know how to prove that it terminates. Okay, maybe you do, but then you'll be really famous very shortly. But apart from that, you almost certainly don't know how to prove that it's terminating because nobody does. Okay. So you won't even be able to program it, even though it's total function, if it is total function, it might turn out to be a total function. But even if you find out that it's total function, then if you're gonna write in a language you, which you can only write total function, it means you have to write the code in such a way that the proof of termination is, in, is somehow encoded in the code itself. It's written, written right in front of you. Just think of it, if I didn't have while loops or recursion, I had to write everything with a for loop. First of all, it'd be kind of miserable, but you'd have the idea that, you know, everything has to terminate because it's just for I equals one to 10. I mean, that's all you're allowed to do. Okay, so everything has to terminate. So the Blum size theorem makes this into a theorem. And so if you have any total programming language whatsoever, there's a function that, uh, a total function on the natural numbers, that's the arena of discussion. There's a total function on the natural numbers whose shortest program in this, in your favorite language that you just introduced is Pick whatever expansion factor you want. Two to the 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 n larger than it would be if you just wrote it down in ML, in which infinite loops are possible. That's called the Blum size theorem. Underappreciated fact from complexity theory. And uh, you can look at that. And here's the thing you're supposed to think about. So the idea is that confining yourself to total functions has a lot of benefits. But if you take account of the complexity of the thing, how long it takes to run, you know, okay, uh, that's one issue. And the other is the size theorem, that the size of the code is gonna be horrible. Because intuitively, take the coalesce conjecture, two line piece of code. The proof that is terminating is bound to be, well, one assumes, when eventually the problem is resolved, it's gonna be some stupendously large proof. So if you're gonna write that code in T or T++, you're gonna have to incorporate that proof into the code. You're not gonna wanna do this. Okay. So you should at least know that this is limitative thing. And I'll, I'll just mention that. There's a little bit more on that in the book if you wanna look at it, but you can do it. All right, so let me finish then for today and tell you what I'm gonna do next time. So next, I wanna talk about Plotkin's PCF. I'm gonna extend it in my way called PCF plus plus. By the way, you'll notice that, uh, I guess I should, I, maybe I said it before, but I'll say it again, because it's worth doing. This is my personal pantheon of uh, programming language researchers. So uh, Gödel, Plotkin, Reynolds, McQueen, those are my heroes. So these are, and I'm explaining to you why, okay? Because there's, I'm elucidating some of their ideas 
and by way of teaching you, um, I think, important ideas in programming languages. And so the idea is that we embrace partiality. But now we get into some further trouble. And the question will be, but how? And here I will be able to show you some things that are maybe not as widely appreciated as they ought to be about some languages that begin with an H in terms of how you be embrace partiality. The way in which it's done is ruinous as far as the expressive power of the language goes. So I'll explain that next time. So I'll talk about that. So the question will be, but how? So that's gonna be the subject of my lecture tomorrow. So I'm happy to ask, answer more questions. I'll put the edited slides out after I finish here. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, or we can take that offline. Uh, Dave is actually retired now, but he was in Chicago with Rappi, but he's retired. He lives in, uh, he lives in uh, Los Gatos uh, within, within sight of the Apple headquarters. Reynolds is John Reynolds, yes. John Reynolds was my colleague for 20 years and uh, I'm very fortunate to have had that. So, um, well, these people are great influences on me. I, I haven't mentioned a few others who are. Milner is a uh, Rob Milner, who I worked with, is also a tremendous influence on me. That will come up a little later because I'm going to use process calculus. So you're going to see how you're going to see my way of thinking about process calculus is for. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that maybe starting next time or the time after. So we'll see how that goes. So then Milner will come into play. So that's another personal hero of mine. And I'm not doing denotational semantics. So unfortunately, I, I don't think I'll find a way to get Dana Scott into it. Uh, but the at least these lectures, I won't be able to do that. But no no slight to Dana, it just, it just so happens that this year I'm not, I won't be able to do that unless I think of something. Um, and so I got uh, another personal hero of mine, but all of it derived from Lambda. So. Church is my academic great grandfather, I like to point out. And uh, Alonzo Church is my hero of heroes. So, the guy who invented the Lambda calculus, amazing. Okay, good. Can I elaborate on further on math being a branch of computer science? Well, okay. Uh, thank you for not writing me up. I talk to Dana regularly. I'll tell him that I mentioned this so that you can I deprive you of the opportunity. Um, let's see. Um, He's living in Berkeley now. He retired a number of years ago. Um, uh, someone said, elaborate on math being. Well, the only thing I can say right now, given my circumstances of what I've developed so far, is that the provers that you know about, many of the provers that you know about, Koch, Lean, Agda, New Pearl, possibly I'm missing some, but those are certainly biggies, are all based on types here, every one of them. And people such as Tom Hales uh, or um, uh, Georges Gontier, many of their collaborators, I don't mean to omit people as a slight, I just am naming a few names that I think are prominent and uh, are mechanizing large bodies of very sophisticated math using those provers. It's all based on type theory. And so for me, that's just my personal my personal thing is, um, is uh, I, I, I think there is a way I organize my intellectual life. So to me, it pleases me. So, and, and fundamentally because it's all based on computation that it's sort of just saying computer science is the master discipline. I know that's a cheeky thing to say, but I'm saying it just to be entertaining, but I kind of believe that if you want to know the truth. But the people who are using these provers don't have to. They're just, uh, from my point of view, what they like about them is that it's a theory of abstract types. You would not want to mechanize math starting with the axioms of set theory. You can forget it. But you do want to mechanize math using data abstraction like you do when you write code. And that's what type theory is doing for you at a high level. Doesn't tell you what a function is, it just tells you what a function does. 
doesn't tell you what a natural number is, it tells you what it does. That's the whole message of type theory, which by the way, is the message of category theory. You don't care what it is, you only care what it does. Joe Bond. May I ask um, uh, which chapters of your book are gonna be um, helpful for tomorrow? Which parts? Oh, I don't know the chapter numbers off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> the terminology. Okay. You know, you know yeah, by the so, terminology, there it's all um, in there. Yeah, so there's uh, I assume uh, system PCF that part of the book is the most PCF important. is in there, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's called PCF. Um, and then it and will it's called, dynamic. I'm going to be coming up. give it a slightly different treatment. Okay. The supplementary notes give a different treatment of PCF if you look in the supplements at the URL that I suggested earlier. So you can you can do that. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so that's the plan. So what I hope to do in the course of the, these lectures is to touch on subjects and hopefully intrigue you and give you some flavor. I can't, you know, in such a limited setting, I think that's the way in which I can serve you the best is point out a bunch of highlights and show you where to find out more and give you a few exercises to help you get, get a better sense of what's happening. Um, so that's my objective anyway. So I'm addressing the less expert of you and I hope, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, somebody's asking about commuting conversions. Uh, I don't, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to go there at the moment. I asked you on slide one. I'm allowed to not answer your question. <laughs>